Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to try and get a little closer to all of you, so I'm not so far away. But um, So uh, I think the world changed in 1984. And some of you may recall that was the year of the first Macintosh personal computer. But that's not what I'm talking about. In 1984, a guy named Chuck Hall invented something we call stereolithography. Uh, today, we refer to stereolithography as 3D printing. About seven years ago, I bought a 3D printer. It takes a spool of plastic thread, melts it, and uh, sprays it into different shapes. I have three little kids. I have two boys who are nine and seven, and my daughter is three. And they're constantly growing too big for their shoes. And so I just print them sandals all, all summer long. Right? And in fact, my children, when they want Legos, I print them on my printer. My daughter wanted a dinosaur, I printed it. My children are growing up in a world that when they want toys, daddy prints them. I even have a 3D scanner. It costs uh, $200. It attaches to my iPad, uh, my iPad, and I can take a scan of something and then print a copy. Which sounds amazing. You can do a lot of amazing things. Uh, that's actually my 3D printer, the one I have, the Cubex, which is an old model now. But about the time I got my 3D printer, a guy also published the blueprints on how to print guns. Right? That you could just, if you wanted a gun, you could just print it. And this is the promise, this story is about the promise of technology, all of the opportunity, but also about the dangers of it, the way it is moving faster than our uh, institutions can handle. And my central argument, the way I understand technology and its impact on democracy, is that technology is taking power out of democratic institutions and pushing power to individuals and to algorithms. And this has tremendous consequences. All of the big institutions that built democracy in the 20th century, all of them are tremendously fragile. They're at risk. I started my life as a computer programmer. That was my first job, was writing code. And I would sit in meetings in meetings with important people where I was the nerd in the back of the room. And I would hear them talk about the world. And I would think, I don't think I live in their world. I don't know, like at board meetings of big corporations or in Democratic Party meetings or at, even at Harvard faculty meetings. I hear people talk and I think, I don't live in their world. What is going on? And for many years, I thought maybe I was just ignorant or didn't understand what was going on. And then I read this book called The Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman about the start of World War I. And she describes how in 1910, King Edward VII of England died. And when the King of England died, every nation in the world sent people to the funeral. And all of the nations of the world, they sent the biggest display of wealth and power that their nation could muster, they sent to the funeral. She said the funeral was the most opulent event in human history. And if you had been at that funeral in June of 1910, you would think the monarchy would last forever. And in fact, six months later, the new King of England, King George, wrote letters to his best friends and first cousins, the Kaiser of Germany and the Tsar of Russia. And he said, just imagine in 2018 when our grandchildren are monarchs of Europe and the colonies. But of course, it already had rotted out. It was actually already over. And I think this is one of the best ways to understand what's happening right now. The institutions of democracy that look so powerful and strong are tremendously fragile and in a great deal of danger. And I think that begins with computers. If I was giving you this talk 40 years ago, 35 years ago, and I ask you to describe a computer, you would describe that. That's a Cray supercomputer from 1973. And if we had one in this room, it would fill the first four rows here, right? It was a giant machine. And that is a bench. Because what you did is you, 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 you 
went by the computer and you gave it a problem and you went away for two weeks and then you came back and you sat on the bench until it gave you the answer. This computer cost base price about 10 million euros and it was only available to the biggest, and that was about 10 million euros without any memory. That was, the memory was extra. So to really have one was probably 15 to 25 million euros. And so it was only available to the biggest institutions, to the biggest corp corporations, the biggest companies, the biggest governments, and the biggest universities. And so, you know, I was, a, I was a computer nerd in high school, and I badly wanted to play with computers. And if I had been a, a high school computer nerd in the 50s or 60s in the United States, my only hope to play with a computer would be to go to a university. The first year you could uh, major study computer science in the United States was 1962 at Purdue University in the middle of the country. And uh, you had a whole generation of computer scientists, of nerds going to college to play with computers, graduating in the late 60s and early 70s. But what else is happening on college campuses in the 60s? Protest the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, especially the anti-war movement. And who is hiring computer scientists in the 60s and early 70s? The Pentagon, the military is hiring them, or IBM working on military contracts. So you have a generation of computer scientists who want to play with computers, but don't want to work for the military. And that is part of where our computer culture comes from. Ted Nelson wrote this book in 1973, Computer Liberation. You can and must understand computers now. And this book says you cannot trust the people in charge with computers. You cannot trust institutions with computers. They will use computers to send you to wars that make no sense. We must do something radical. We must build a personal computer. We, we, that the only way to make this power free is to share it with everyone. And this was a crazy idea in 1973. But this book and the movement around it inspired a whole generation of computer scientists. If you've read uh, Steve Jobs' biography, this book and the movement behind it helped to inspire him to start Apple Computer. Bill Gates used the first fortune he made to buy the rights to this book and republished it with Microsoft Press in 1984. This book shaped our modern age. It inspired a whole generation. In fact, Ted Nelson, who wrote it, he invented something you, you use every day. He invented the hyperlink. If you click on a link, that's thanks to Ted. But this idea that you couldn't trust power with computers that we needed to take computers away from the people in charge. That was a radical idea, and that was part of the story of how we go from the 70s, computers filling a room, to in the 80s, the personal computer sitting on people's desks and at home. And then in the 90s, we start to plug them into each other to share things like the printer. And then in the 2000s, we plug all the computers into all the other computers and we have the internet. And now today we walk around with this device on our person that is incredibly powerful. It's so much more powerful than a Cray supercomputer that you can't compare them. You know, an airplane and a bicycle are both modes of transportation. And this phone and the Cray supercomputer are both computers. That's the kind of difference we're talking about. It's as if, imagine if I said to you that 35 years from now, You'll be able to walk into any store anywhere in the world and for 200 euros and a low monthly fee buy a Boeing 747 powered by a nuclear engine. You would think I was crazy, but that's what happened with computing power. It's, 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 it's an unbelievable change. And one really essential component of this computing power is that it pushes power to the individual and to algorithms. But they, I'm going to start with the individual and particularly talk about it and the consequences it has for democratic institutions. So, in the United States, prior to about 2004, 
The way American politics worked is you had the news media establishment, stream media, and you had the political establishment, and they argued. Uh, Ronald Reagan or Jimmy Carter would say, here's what's happening in America. And then journalists would say, well, I don't know, that doesn't seem right, what about this, what about that? And they basically argued, and they came up with a narrative for the country. They delivered to a public a narrative, a story about what was happening in the country, right? And that was, that was, that was the chief way that American politics functioned. But then, and actually, let me, let me tell you a couple stories about this. Let me, let's talk about this through the thinking about some key moments in American history. Uh, uh, November 1963, what happens? Kennedy is shot. Most Americans find out Kennedy is shot from the radio or the television. At the time, one of the main uh, anchors on the nightly news was this guy, Walter Cronkite. And Walter Cronkite was a very serious guy. And he would end his broadcast, he'd say, and that's the way it is, right? And in many ways to uh, the American public, he was the voice of truth and seriousness. And every American who was alive remembers what Walter Cronkite did when he learned John F. Kennedy had been shot and died. He took off his glasses and he cried. He cried on television. Right? And then we think about another major incident from American history 15, 20, 15 ish years later uh, Watergate, right? Two journalists at the Washington Post, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, took down a U.S. president. And then we think about another major event, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, most Americans experienced that. That was when CNN, CNN went from a, uh, a footnote, from a strange thing that Ted Turner was doing to the primary way Americans would get international news. What was happening around the world? What was happening the fall of the cold, end of the Cold War? It was about CNN. And uh, one of the CNN anchors, Bernard Shaw, and then we even think about September 11th and how Americans experienced September 11th. And Rudy Giuliani was mayor of New York City. And twice a day, he gave a press conference. And every single TV and radio station tuned in twice a day to his press conference. You couldn't even, if you were a kid, you couldn't even watch cartoons, right? This was, these were, these were a, a series of, of major events in American history and the primary way Americans learned about them and understood them was through a journalist, it was through a journalist, through a, me through, through, through a newsroom. But now let's talk about the day Osama bin Laden was killed. Most Americans found out Osama bin Laden had been killed from social media. In fact, this guy, Keith Urban, tweeted, so I'm told by a reputable person they've killed Osama bin Laden. Hot damn. Keith Urban had been Donald Rumsfeld's chief of staff. But of course, Donald Rumsfeld's a Republican. Keith is a Republican. Uh, but when Osama bin Laden was killed, uh, uh, Obama was president. And so he was not, he did not work in the government. He was a, he was a speechwriter, a consultant. And, uh, but he heard a rumor and he tweeted it. And the, he had about 400 followers, and the tweet went viral, reaching millions of Americans in just under two hours. Had a dramatic impact. So here's a major, the first, I think you could say, the first major historical event in American history that was not delivered to the public by journalists. And then I always have to add, this guy lived across the street from Osama bin Laden, and live tweeted the whole raid by accident. It, there's a helicopter on my neighbor's roof at one o'clock. That's so unusual. And it's kind of crazy. All right. So we have this, we have this, uh, uh, we have this, this process, right? Where we have the news media establishment and the political establishment, and they work out a narrative for the American people, and that that is the way American politics works. But now, now it's different. Now the internet has showed up, right? But it's not like everybody's paying attention. It's more, sometimes I, I call it the net roots. A small group of people on the internet 
who self-select and pay close attention and participate in the discussion, right? The net roots try and shape that the elites, the media elite and the political elite were having this discussion, when now people on the internet weigh in and try and shape the discussion as well. And so you have the media elite, the political elite, and self-selected individuals and activists on the internet trying to participate in that same discussion and, discussion and shape the campaign narrative, right? And that, that is where we end up running into a real problem with mis and disinformation. This is a visual representation of the internet. If you were gonna map the internet, this is what it looks like, right? It's diffuse, it's spread out. One of those dots is, the, is CNN, and one of those dots is my mother taking photos of her garden, all right? They, they look the same. And the, uh, this, this, this diffusion, this, this equalizing almost of CNN and my mother's blog about her garden, this has created huge challenges for the news industry. You know, in the United States, we don't have a tradition of public media like Europe does. Uh, we have public media in the United States, government-funded media. We have national public radio and PBS, but actually very small percentage of their money comes from the government. It varies, but it's generally, I'd say, less than 10% of, of their money comes from government. Most of it comes from people buying memberships or from uh, philanthropy, from charity. And so we don't really have a, a, a robust public uh, news option. Almost all of our news in the United States comes from uh, for-profit corporations. And almost all of the ones that generate news are newspapers. Newspapers generate more than 85% of the news in the United States. And something terrible has happened to newspapers. The business has collapsed. This red line here, that is uh, print newspaper revenue, and blue line is new online news revenue. And so in 2000, print revenue was about $65 billion, and by 2017, it's approximately 12 billion. A 15-year collapse just disappeared. And what does that mean? Well, let me tell you about this. So I used to work on the business side of the Los Angeles Times, and today's a Monday, a full page advertisement in the Los Angeles Times on a Monday is about $40,000 to reach 400,000 readers. To reach the same 400,000 readers on the LA Times website is about $5,600. And to reach the same 400,000 readers with a Google search ad buy is $16. And that's what's happened to the news business, right? And of course, that means the number of newspaper companies has collapsed but that could just be mergers and acquisitions. So this graph, that blue line that's dropping, that is the number of journalists employed in the United States. Uh, it was about a little bit more than 420,000 in the year 2000, and today it's about 140,000, right? And so uh, that has consequences. There are 21, you know, in the United States, we have 50 states, 21 states that send no journalists to Washington, D.C., that means there are 42 U.S. senators who never get asked by a journalist from their home when they're working in D.C. about their work. And that's also 21 states that get no news about what the government's doing. What does Obama's new health insurance plan, does this mean that our hospital op stays open or closes? We don't know. There's no news. And so this has profound consequences. This is a map of news deserts. The, the, the dark red means there's news there and everything else is no news. The light red and the white. In fact, really what this map says is that if you live outside the 10 largest cities in the United States, you probably don't have much news. And so we just, for 15 years, scooped out all of the news. It's gone. So of course something is going to fill that void. That's a giant void that that exists, that is being filled. Uh, sometimes we call it, my colleague at Harvard, Tom Patterson, calls it information pollution, right? It's not quality news, it's information pollution. We've done a lot of research on this space. 
We call it information disorder. There are seven major kinds in our taxonomy. The first is satire or parody, people doing something because they think it's funny, but accidentally sometimes it gets taken as true. Another example is uh, misleading content where you describe something, but you leave out something important, right? So what you're describing is true, you just leave out some important pieces of information. Imposter content, this is when an article appears to be a CNN article or a BBC article, but actually is not. Totally fabricated content, all the way on the left, totally made up. On the, on the bottom here, false connection, where the headline says one thing, but the text else, sometimes we call that clickbait. False context. Uh, a good example of false context it happens with big storms or hurricanes, uh, where there'll be a photo of a flooded street on Facebook, and people are saying, the street's closed, the street's closed. Well, the photo's a real photo, but it's from six years ago, and the street isn't closed. That's, a, that's false context. And then manipulated content is a new and emerging threat photos, videos, PDFs that are edited or changed, right? And that can be very hard to detect. And we, we also break it down into three different kinds. We're trying to define our terminology here a bit. Misinformation is false, but there is no intent to harm. Disinformation is both false and intended to cause harm. And malinformation is true, but intended to call, cause harm. So an example of malinformation is, uh, it looks pretty clear now that the Russian uh, intelligence agencies hacked into Hillary Clinton's campaign, stole a bunch of emails, gave them to WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks puts them out. Yes, they are true. Those are true emails, but the intent is clearly to cause harm. Uh, and an important question is how widespread is fake news? We don't really know because Facebook and YouTube won't tell us. But uh, we have some guesses. Uh, Pew did a big survey, right? Said more than 85% of Americans had been confused by something online. But the crazier thing is that one in four Americans shared something on the internet that they were pretty sure was false. So they knew it wasn't true and they shared it anyway. What is going on? Um, and then Craig Silverman at BuzzFeed did a study of the top 20 most shared articles on Facebook leading up to the 2016 election and discovered that 10 of them were totally false. The, Trump, the, the Pope endorses Trump. Never happened, but was a very popular article on Facebook. So, you know, it used to be that you had a, a message, you had news, or you had a political candidate, and you had to go to the media, right, to reach the public. And the media acted as a gatekeeper. The media acted as a filter, as a way of assessing, is this true, should this go to the public? And then the internet arrived, and at first, uh, anyone could go to the internet. You could just publish anything you wanted on the internet. Right? But then we started publishing too much stuff. In fact, um, if you, I may get this a little bit wrong, but if you take every piece of information ever created by humans, you start with cave paintings and you go down to the first books and the first paintings and sculpture and everything ever created by humans up until about 2010, that's how much information is now created every 24 hours. And navigating that volume of data, navigating that volume of data requires algorithms, right? And so we have a situation where actually all three are at work. You have to go through the media, but you can go through algorithms which have their own bias. Frequently a bias is very bad, or I shouldn't say bad. Frequently a bias that doesn't, the bias of algorithms is towards monetization towards making money. And that has all kinds of unintended bad consequences or side effects. And then you can also still go directly to the public. And Donald Trump is a master of manipulating all three of these. 
He knows how to manipulate the media and the bias of the media. He knows how to manipulate the algorithm. He knows how to create content that the algorithms will privilege. Why? The algorithms uh, privilege basically strong emotions and fear and hate are strong emotions. And um, he knows how to speak directly to his own public with Twitter. Not the public, his own public. And so sometimes I say that um, you know, fake news is nothing new. Misinformation is nothing new. It's been around uh, for a long time. I think it's the election of, election of 1800 uh, that uh, Thomas Jefferson thought he might lose. So he spread, his people spread rumors, printed up bills that said John Adams had died. And then John Adams had to hire people on horses to run through town saying, he's not dead, he's not dead. So fake news has been around for a long time. But, um, uh, but about 12 years ago, somebody wrote an email. We don't know who. Somebody wrote an email that said, Barack Obama is a Muslim born outside the United States. And the Washington Post estimates that 100 million Americans have read that email. And I say that email was... That email launched a thousand PhD theses. That meant that misinformation on the internet has become one of the most studied things. So we know a few things. There are a few things that are real academic consensus around. The first is rumors are sticky. The brain likes rumors. And generally speaking, the crazier the rumor, the better. A second thing we know is that uh, corrections backfire. They fade. If I say to you, Obama is a Muslim is false, 10 days from now, what you remember is Obama is a Muslim, right? And we know that source credibility is paramount. If I never believe Fox News, it doesn't matter what they say, I'm never gonna believe them. If I never believe the New York Times, it doesn't matter what they say, I'm never gonna believe them. And so when we think about solutions, right, well, we need to find ways of making the truth louder. And this is where the algorithms come in, because they don't do that right now. In fact, in some ways right now, they privilege rumor. The second thing we need to do is we need to, the media, the journalists, journalists have to find different ways of telling stories. You know, the habit in journalism, what we teach in journalism schools is that, you, that you, you make corrections, that you say Obama is a Muslim is false is the headline. No, the headline should be, look at these photos of Obama's baptism in a church, right? You need different alternative narratives that do not repeat the claim. And then the hardest one is as American politics and media become tribal, become highly partisan, how do you get partisan leaders the tribal leaders to participate. In many ways, the leaders of the Republican Party let the lie that Obama is a Muslim persist. They, they very rarely said it was a lie. The exception is John McCain. There's a major exception. So those are some things we know and some solutions, but there are still big problems. I just showed you these terrible images of the collapse of local news. Even if today, boom, Facebook and YouTube said no more fake news, there wouldn't be enough real news. The second problem is that the digital platforms like Facebook and YouTube, they're opaque. They don't tell us what's going on. We don't know how serious the problem is. We're guessing, we're in the dark. And one of the reasons, one of the challenges is that the algorithms the algorithms are designed for trust, but they're not designed for truth, because it turns out you can build ways of measuring trust, but it's very hard to measure truth. And then finally, I think the, the most important thing in many ways is to demand accountability, right? In the United States, eight digital companies control the public sphere, Amazon, Apple, eBay, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Snapchat, and Twitter. Those companies have the power to decide what our culture is. And that, is, uh, that raises many hard questions. So that's my talk, a whirlwind tour.